While the Russian investigation may be over, the debate over the Mueller report is not. At the end of May, the DOJ agreed to turn over 12 categories of counterintelligence and foreign intelligence materials to the House Intelligence Committee. In exchange, the committee will not enforce their subpoena of Attorney General William Barr, but should the focus still be on the report or preventing future election interference? In his book, The Shadow War, CNN's chief national security correspondent, Jim Shudo, gives us an in-depth look at election interference and the national security threats that he says many Americans may not know about. He joins us now to discuss the book and these global threats. Thank you for being here, Jim. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So first of all, uh, you wrote what's a pretty substantive book here while you were also reporting every day. Where did you find the time to get a book done like this? It's funny. So, so, so planes, trains, yeah. automobiles, and hotel rooms, really, and cafes, actually. There's, you know, I, so I, I started writing the book January last year, yeah. about 80,000 words for a book of 300 pages, and I, did, and I just did the math, and I, I needed to give it in in July. Mm -hmm. So I said I'm going to write 7,000 words, 10,000 words a month. At 2,500 words yeah. a week, and, and just try to keep to that. And I found, found if I was keeping to that, because you, you can always write 500 words in a day, sure. or if you have an hour, find of a way you to can. bang yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, if with when coffee's yeah. involved, you, know, you can make it happen. <laughs> but a, lo a lot of the reporting I had already done. A lot of the travel I'd been to Ukraine. I'd mm -hmm. been to U.S. Space Command. Uh, I'd been to the South China Sea. Uh, so, so, so I had the notes and I had the stories kind of in my head, and then it was just about getting it out on paper. And, and I was doing interviews with, with the former and current intelligence officials, defense officials, et cetera, like the Jim Clappers, the Michael Haydens, the Ash Carters of the world, as I was going. Uh, and oftentimes, because these officials had been involved themselves as these stories were playing out, their, their interviews just, just sort of naturally fit into the storyline. You know, so give I, the, on that day, here's where I yeah. was and here's what was happening. Give the audience just a little a taste of the, the premise of the book. Okay, so the premise is, is that both China and Russia, not together, but remarkably fighting a similar kind of strategy, both China and Russia are fighting, in effect, an undeclared war on the U.S. on multiple fronts. Uh, Americans, I think, are aware of one or two of the fronts. Uh, election interference yep. by Russia, uh, theft of state secrets by China, uh, you know, some skirmishes in Ukraine, mm. manufacturing of territory in the South China Sea. So they're aware of some of the fronts, but but not all of them. Uh, one in particular that whenever I bring this up, folks, you know, their eyes, uh, their eyes pop uh, that both Russia and China have deployed space weapons today. They're floating yep. above our heads couple hundred miles, a few thousand miles, depending on the orbit, uh, weapons designed to disable or neutralize U.S. space assets that we and our military depend on. Uh, smart bombs aren't smart without satellites. Uh, drones don't fly. Uh, we don't have nuclear early warning. China and Russia know that, so they've deployed satellites that can disable. Kamikaze satellites, kidnapper satellites that can pluck satellites out of yep. orbit. Uh, they know about uh, cyber attacks, but they don't know about the scale of those cyber attacks. And the other front, I think, that I talk about a lot and I think folks don't know too much about is that there's a battle under the seas right now, a battle for su supremacy in submarine mm -hmm. technology. And both Russia and China have deployed faster, quieter submarines. A submarine that's faster and quieter can turn up off your coast. They carry nuclear weapons and, and deliver nuclear weapons or to your homeland. Or just cut your internet service, right? Or I mean, cut your internet. Yeah. There is, there's a, there's yeah. a uh, talk about that in there. The mm -hmm. Russia has this specially designed sub that is messing around on the uh, sub-Pacific and sub-Atlantic uh, cables that carry internet traffic with the capability of slicing right. them. And, and that would paralyze us as well. So, so multi-front, permanent war, and just one more detail, below the threshold of where they believe the U.S. will respond decisively. And they're pretty good at calculating uh, where that is. You know, we may complain, we may slap some sanctions on them, but what, what have we really done to punish Russia for invading Ukraine or China for, in effect, invading the South China Sea? Or for the 2016 hack? Clearly not enough to change the behavior because they're still doing it. Well, that's what I thought was interesting. The last section of the book, which is the lessons learned, what might the U.S. do uh, in part. I did find one thing interesting where you thought, you, you suggested almost that the U.S. should be interfering in Russian elections. Mm. Is, that, is that the different way? That, should, am I reading that the wrong way? Because I, I found that a very uh -huh. provocative suggestion. Well, for, first of all, yeah. to be clear, the, yeah. I polled half a dozen current mm -hmm. and former officials, both, both American and, and European, former head of MI6, the, the sitting president of Estonia, which has been on the front lines yeah. of Russian attacks, including in the first chapter of the book, the first nation-on-nation -nation cyber attack. Um, in terms of interfering in the elections, a couple of folks brought up the idea of doing information ops targeting Russia, mm -hmm. not in the same way, not stealing 
John Podesta's sure. emails, for instance, and dumping them 20 minutes after the Access Hollywood right. tape. Um, you know, that was during with the, 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 ODNI during letter, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, but they, they bring up the idea of exposing Putin, for instance, of who he is. Mm -hmm. I, I believe this is Ash Carter who, who brought this up. You know, Putin, who steals money from his people, exposing his financial records, records exposing him as a thief, for instance. Mm -hmm. so, so that kind of counter-information op, as opposed to the kinds of election interference that, that Russia has Do we worry here. that it might inter it might you know, it might invite even more so? Or is it just, is it your contention and theirs really that we're already at the point where they're blatantly interfering in our elections, mm -hmm. it's time that we would do this? Well, th th yeah. there, there are other officials who make a counterpoint to that. Mm -hmm. There is debate about this on each of these steps. Uh, I believe it was M Michael Hayden who, who said, who was opposed to that kind of information op because the one on, on the premise that, that it would feed Putin's paranoia, which is already right. deep, <laughs> and you see it you see it in a lot of instances yeah. that it might be counterproductive. So so on some of these measures there is a debate. I mean for instance on space, do does the US deploy space weapons like Russia and China to deter uh, there is a school of thought that yes, you do, because they're already up there and you got to play by these new Wild West rules. There are others who are concerned that if you do that, you spark a space arms race. And better to negotiate a treaty first, kind of like we have for the law of the sea, so that you establish some rules up there. But I they mean, break the law of the sea already, so, right? True. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the U.S. hasn't ratified it. Yeah, so, which we, you know, there, we there's, also there, there are some questions there, yes. <laughs> so uh, the U.S. is so much more dependent on um, its internet. In mm -hmm. connectivity uh, than China is, for instance, yeah. or from, than Russia is. Mm -hmm. um, is this a war that the U.S. can win if we yeah. actually get into ratcheting up? Well, this, this, the shadow war is by its nature asymmetric. Here are two countries, China and Russia, that, that want to undermine and, and particularly in China's case, ultimately surpass the U.S., but they know that the U.S. has advantages, so they seek to undercut some of those advantages, one of which is technology. And, and that's that's true in the cyber realm and it's true in in the space realm. So these are by nature a asymmetric. So, so that our strengths are not so much our weaknesses as our vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. and they seek to exploit those. Uh, and one is enormous dependence on technology. I mean, water, power, mm -hmm. uh, telecommunications, all the yep. things that we all depend on every single day, just to get through this morning, Absolutely. we've already dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, all of it is connected. It is. Uh, in, you know, cyberspace. It is. And, you know, let's think in both the military and the space realm. So first, military. Our military, bigger, more advanced, uh, so dependent on these technologies, uh, and, and China and Russia can't compete there, so they seek to undermine. And, and I speak to U.S. commanders who say the trouble is it's great to be this advanced, but when it's taken away, can we fight without it? Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. they'd be thrown back into sort of not quite civil war, but yeah. World War II mode here. You know, let, let me find my sextant right. so I could so I could <laughs> point the ship in the right direction. They teaching that at the Naval yeah. Academy. They, absolutely, right. because they, they said there might come a day when the GPS goes out. Exactly. Uh, so so that's in the military in the military realm, and, and then in the civilian realm. I mean, there are the ways we know, for instance, we depend on satellite technology. I mean, we'd all be lost, right, <laughs> without GPS. But do folks know that GPS provides time, time stamps for financial transactions? So you take out GPS satellites or disable it, the financial markets come to a stop. Uh, railroad uh, switches dependent on GPS. So, so you could paralyze or significantly undermine railroad traffic. Um, and, and they know that. So they know that in the event of a war, something short of a war, they could make us pay a heavy price. One of the things that you talk about in the book is about the specialty of Russian disinformation. Mm -hmm. So now that the Mueller report and all that has come out, do you think that there's a chance, I've been speaking to some former CIA operatives, that the dossier, the Steele dossier itself, was Russian disinformation, since so much of it, it, it seems that Christopher Steele has been either proven to be mm -hmm. untrue, he's claiming there's a Russian consulate in Miami and there's, mm -hmm. there is no Russian consulate. He made many claims which did not get confirmed by the Mueller report. Is there a chance there that that might be Russian disinformation? It, it's possible, or portions uh -huh. of it, right? I mean, remember, what was the dossier but a collection of leads, yes. right, and, and, and ideas? some of which did stand up, multiple contacts, mm -hmm. of course, initially and repeatedly denied by the Trump campaign, and, and, but there were multiple contacts. Uh, it, it, the question is, you know, what was the substance of those conversations? Uh, was it just establishing contacts or, or were they discussing something more? So, you know, I, I think you have to look at the dossier as what it was, which was kind of a raw tip sheet in a way, but it's certainly possible that some of those sources were feeding well, disinformation. The, the most incendiary claims, like the Prague meeting, you know, right. that didn't happen. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, the P-tape, well, we're still not quite sure about that one, <laughs> yeah. but it, it seems not to, uh, to have occurred. And it, it, it just, 
so much of our airtime over the last two years was focused on litigating these claims, mm -hmm. it seems that they might have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Well, the one yeah. thing we, we get into a lot here in this book is, is that Russian disinformation has multiple goals, right? One, and when you look at the election interference, is purely to heighten divisions that already exist here not just in the political space, Democrat versus Republican, Trump versus Clinton, but on a whole host of other controversial issues. Uh, Russians very active in Black Lives Matter. Uh, mm -hmm. Russians very active in, in, in the Take a Knee protests in the NFL. And Michael Hel Hayden tells a great story in here. One reason the U.S. knew that Russia was behind some of these bots that were getting heavy into the NFL protests was because the hashtag was Take a Knee. Uh, the Russian bots kind of screwed up the translation on some of this, <laughs> and they put the hashtag take the knee, <laughs> because it's hard to get right, those right, particles, right. Those, 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 those articles, right, those yeah, articles right. of speech yeah. right, and that was one way you knew. So, so part of the motivation is just mess with us, mm -hmm. right? So here, and they do that really well. So here's but the there thing. was also a motivation yeah. to disable a candidacy and, and, and help a candidacy. Right, so I'm, I'm, this is something that preoccupies me a lot. Because last week, but about 10 days ago, we saw the Urban League come out with their State of Black America report where mm -hmm. they talk about the Russian attempt to manipulate race and to, talk, and to go after many of the African-American activists that were mm -hmm. out there. And how they want to see the government and others take this on because they feel personally yeah. affronted that the Russians did this. I wonder why it is that there are other people who were attacked who don't seem to have the same level of vitriol, right? Yeah. We look at the state of Florida and election mm -hmm. machines that were attacked. We know it's happened. We know at least in two counties that happened. You don't see a senator like Rick Scott or you don't no. see even the governor of Florida coming out with the same kind of demand. They're not like holding a press conference on the White House steps saying, protect us, yeah. save us. Um, what does that do um, when our opponents see uh, people in our country not really reacting. It, disab it disables the U.S. response because, because the interference, which is a fact, has mm -hmm. been so politicized. Uh, and part of that goes back to the president. He doesn't, you, you, Chris Kirsten Nielsen on her way out, Mick Mulvaney says don't bring up election interference because the president associates that with uh, somehow undermining his election victory. A and that disables the response because w one of the solutions or recommendations th that everyone I spoke to and these are, keep in mind, are officials who serve both Democratic and Republican administrations, is that you need clear leadership. You need clear red lines. You need a clear, you need a whole of government response, which to this point, we don't have as a country. And, and this has struck me. Uh, when I talk to the submarine commanders, okay, when I talk to the folks at U.S. Space Command, the folks spy, fly, flying the spy missions over Russia, the folks sitting inside the uh -huh. NSA Operations Center responding to Russian and Chinese cyber attacks, they speak with one voice. Mm -hmm. This is a threat. Russia and certainly China, they're adversaries and we have to respond forcefully here. Uh, you can't doubt their motivations. Uh, you don't hear the same thing coming from the top of the administration. And, and that, so it's not, it's not angry Democrats who are making these points, it's, it's men and women in uniform who are on the front, front lines of this. They recognize the threat and they're, they're desperate for leadership. I also want to talk about China, because I know you mm -hmm. served as a diplomat, I think, in mm -hmm. China under the Obama administration. Do you, what do you think of the president's move to block Huawei from the U, from U.S. communications infrastructure? Does that seem like uh, going in the right direction? And now they're actually reportedly going after Hikvision, which mm -hmm. is a surveillance company yep. that is used to suppress the Uyghur Muslim population. Listen, credit where credit yeah. is due. Yeah. Where, where the, the president will not confront the Russia threat to the degree that folks on the front lines of this battle are demanding. On China, the president has been willing to confront uh, its bad trade practices uh, which include the theft of national security secrets to a degree that previous presidents have not. Uh, Huawei, and here's the thing, I spent a lot of time in China even before the time I served as chief of staff to the ambassador. Th there's no firewall between Chinese state enterprises or Chinese right. private sector companies and the government. They, 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 they work for the country's interests, right? And by law, they're, they're required to play ball mm -hmm. on these issues. There's so, no Apple conscientious objector. No, yeah. there is not. Yeah. And, and so, so those security concerns are genuine. And to confront the Huawei issue is, is the right thing to do. And you hear this from Republicans and Democrats. It's, 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 an, it's a rare point of, agree, of agreement, both on the national security front, but also on the trade front because there's no question that China is a bad trade actor. They cheat. They, they disadvantage U.S. and Western companies in China in a way that we do not disadvantage them. So that's a fact. Now the question is what do you do and what's going to work in response? What appears to be happening here is that the 
the U.S. has come so hard after China here that, that, that she is ret retreating to a corner to some degree. Because one thing I always say is that China is not a democracy, right? It's, it's an authoritarian country, but it does have domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And those domestic politics prevent a Chinese leader from being seen as kowtowing to a U.S. president. So if, if, if you're coming in, beating them over the head with a cudgel, it may mean that, that we have started a trade war that's going to last for decades. And there is a school of thought, Chinese businessmen and U.S. businessmen, that are, that are preparing for that. Now, now, is it necessary? Maybe. But there are going to be costs for all involved. And it does appear that U.S. The U.S. market and consumers were going to end up paying some of that cost. More. Yeah. Not just Certainly in tariffs. I also do, do, you know, do this as an exercise. Sit in your living room. See how much in your living room is made in China or for a portion of its mm -hmm. production stops in China. Your iPhone, yeah, your think. furniture, your TV set, etc. Now, are you willing to pay 50% more for that? Twice as much, you know, over time if these things move to places where it's more expensive and so on? We may have to, because there are other costs to it being so cheap, right? Whether it be American jobs or the fact that U.S. companies have gotten, you know, cheated out of so much of their their intellectual property over the years. But that, but that's a fact. But well, we could uh, we could yeah, keep we this could conversation all this going all day. But you understand this? You're in the yeah. business. Our time is up. Uh, the book is called The Shadow War, and uh, the author is Jim Shudo. Thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks so much for having us. Really enjoyed the conversation. It. Talk so, to you more. More coming on up for you on Rising.